of frustration. Full of despair. From years of hurt, disappointment and relegation. Two British football fans have had enough. Canary Bird Elliot Holman and Wanderer Henry Hewitt are in search of glory, pride, passion, in search of silverware. And they found Major League Soccer. Hey, this is Elliot from the MLS UK show. Thank you for coming back. We've got a very special episode right here. I'm flying solo because Henry's flying to Mexico. Uh, he's on his honeymoon. We'll allow it. We authorize the absence. Uh, but it does mean that I get to hang out with an MLS UK show legend, somebody who's appeared on the game with the changing name, someone who's had a career here in the UK and over in MLS and have continued their career as part of the MLS setup as well. Over in the West, over in Portland, it is, of course, former Portland Timber, Liam Ridgewell. And we're chatting to him now. We really, really hope you enjoy this because he was really open, really honest, said I could ask him absolutely anything. And uh, I particularly like some of his favorite memories and highlights from playing in MLS. Check this out. Elliot Holman, Henry Hewitt. MLS UK show. Welcome to another special episode of the MLS UK show. While Henry is flying halfway across the world over to Mexico, uh, I get the good job. I'm hanging out with MLS legend Liam Ridgewell. Welcome to the MLS UK show. Thank you so much. Appreciate you for having me on. Um, we've already we've already talked about you quite a lot on the show for obvious reasons. You're one of uh, a select few, a special club who's obviously played in the UK and in MLS. Um, and certainly a man who's known over here as well as over in the States. When I first got into MLS properly, which was probably around the time that you, you first started in MLS, I was like, I know that name. You were one of the first players that s- like really stood out to me. And I was like, I know that name. Liam Ridgewell's played in MLS. That obviously is happening more and more and more now. Um, you must be pretty proud to see more players making the jump over there. I am. I mean, I I was the same as you. Mine was David Beckham. He was the one that came over and and sort of started it for me. And I always thought that I wanted to come to MLS. It was always an idea. I never thought it would actually come off. I always, you know, used to catch it on TV TV a little bit less than what it is right now. But um, getting the chance was was super proud to be able to do it and come over and actually be successful in doing it. And now more and more people coming over and more and more people texting about wanting to come over as well. Um, only shows how far the league has grown and is still growing. So, I mean, I mean, you know, I'm proud to be part of that that growing of of the league. And uh, yeah, I was buzzing to to get over here, and uh, it's been an amazing experience. It's certainly certainly uh, a very successful tenure in in MLS for yourself. What's it like now that you're back? Because you're back in Rose City, um, you know, working with the Timbers once again. Does it just feel like home? It did. When the opportunity came up, obviously COVID, um, you know, stopped me coming back earlier. Um, so that, that was a bit of a shame, but obviously getting back and, and get the opportunity to come back in a different role, obviously in broadcasting right now. Um, yeah, I'm doing a bit of coaching in the 17s uh, and I were down in the club and, and I enjoy that. But obviously my role is broadcasting it and got the opportunity to come back and yeah, delighted to come back. It was it was somewhere that we missed and somewhere that when the opportunity came up, it was sort of a no-brainer. Obviously, I've got two older kids uh, who live with their mum in the UK. So that was obviously a sticky point, but uh, they, were, they were okay with it. Uh, my oldest one's actually coming out to live with us in, in July and moving out here as well. So, uh, yeah, it was, it, it was a tough one, but it wasn't a tough one because we love the place so much. Yeah, of course. It's not a difficult decision to go and live over there. I, I, we've talked about it so much on the show. Um, you know, Henry's been, uh, I've spent loads of time. Um, I, for my sins, I support Orlando. Uh, and that's just from going on holiday and, and falling in love with, with MLS, as, as, as so many people have done. Um, but it's much talked about on the show that um, Portland and, and Oregon and all of Cascadia is so high on my list of places to visit um, when, I, when I head over West next got to do it even even some of the stuff that sounds really boring like the national parks and so it just looks absolutely stunning if you had told me to go and explore a park and see some trees there's no way i would want to do it i would have kicked you in your teeth but (laughs) it's an incredible place and it really is 
out here, Portland, all about to Seattle, all the way down to Bend, Oregon. I mean, we go and stay over weekends and go down there, whether it's golfing or taking the kids. And uh, it's a special place and it's a spectacular place. It's it's green. It's like England. It's certainly green. You, you get plenty of rain, but the summers <laughs> are beautiful. They're, they're long, so you can enjoy. If you want to camp out, you can do. It's not a, a high on my list, but I've done it before, <laughs> sitting, sitting by the fire with a, a bit of whiskey and smoking cigars. It's... It's a pretty place. So, uh, no, it's, it's one that should everybody should be on their bucket list. I'm glad it's not just me that wants to go and enjoy a bit of a, see a tree in a field. Um, let's, let's go right back to the start because your, uh, your very first league appearance, I believe, was for Bournemouth. Is that right? That's correct, yeah. And uh, I was reading earlier on that um, you came on for Rob Edwards, who now, of course, is, is the Watford manager. What a bizarre world that we live in. <laughs> it's so, it, I mean, it's crazy. I mean, obviously, and as like that, and you've got Perchy as well, who's with uh, uh, up at Newcastle. I think yeah. he's on the assistant managers up there. So, I mean, it was strange. Obviously, it was a, a loan period for me that I was going down there, um, a club that had taken in so many you know, Jermaine Defoe, so many people in uh, to Bournemouth and they were sort of the, the feeder club or the club that you went to because they played good football and they were, they were great Preston Villa and West Ham alike. So, uh, yeah, it was an experience going down there. It was a little bit different. We our first training session, I just remember, they were saying you're going to play against a big six foot five centre forward. I can't remember recollecting name, his name now. Uh, I think it might have been Latin Orient, but uh, they basically just got the balls on the halfway line and smashed them as high and as hard as they could and asked me to go and hit them. And I was like, okay, this is football. We're going to learn here. And uh, it was a great experience, it really was, at Bournemouth. And uh, I loved it. I loved the club. It was great. Sounds like Burnley, to be honest. Um, anyway, I believe, I believe your first goal that you scored was against my team, Norwich City. And that's, that just says it all about Norwich because that is, that is classic Norwich, that is. No, oh, we'll even let someone who's never even scored before in their career have a go. Just, no, just let them through. Let them wander through. <laughs> Fond memories of playing Norwich. It was, it was great, yeah. Um, I, I want to obviously um, talk about talk about MLS and, and your time in Portland for obvious reasons, but I want to talk about MLS rivalries because we've talked about this at length on on the show. Obviously, Portland has a big rivalry with with Seattle and, and, and in Cascadia. Is it as big? Are rivalries actually as real in MLS? So I, the right, right, the rivalry is real. It's massive as well. The fans. You know that they don't like each other, and when we go up there and they come down here, um, there is a big rivalry. They like to try and out sing each other. Um, you know, there's not fighting and things like that, but it, there's certainly rivalry. The part that I find hard with it, and I, I talk about it with everyone all the time, people in Portland support the Seattle Seahawks, the NFL <laughs> team, so but then they don't like the football team or the soccer team, as they call it. So I'm like, how's that a rivalry? And it's so far away as well. But they are they are closest rivals, and the games are so they are huge. They really are. They're something that you look to at the start of the season, similar to at home. You know, if anyone's you know Arsenal, Spurs, you know Manchester United, Man City, you know they they'll look at the games of when their derby games are, and that's what you do here. I used to do it. I'd look at where we're going to play Seattle. Fingers crossed, it wasn't middle of the day at one o'clock in July and <laughs> August, which most of the time it is. It's yeah. the hottest day in the world. But uh, now it is it's huge. I've struggled to come around to it, but you, you get it. The fans let you know and they, they don't let you forget that. The reason I ask is uh, we see teams uh, join MLS and all of a sudden it's it's rivalry week. And it's like, well, they've just joined the league and they're being, you know, we saw it with Atlanta v Orlando. And then Orlando said, see you, or, see you Atlanta, we've got Miami now. You know, it's it's very it's all very new, I suppose. It's, it's the history. But the reason I wanted to speak to you about it is because you played for three Birmingham clubs. That's borderline impressive like how have you got away with that <laughs> well I don't know if I did get away with it for one but I think uh yeah that that's where I because I know I mean being from the UK you know rivalries and the rivalry is across the road you know literally across the road a street so obviously coming here you had to get used to it or I had to get used to it here that they then they're natural with it but it is a rivalry and it's also new the good thing about the Portland Seattle it's been going back years you know even before the MLS was around so uh that makes it I'm sure a little bit easier but these are all got things got to start somewhere and if you don't like a team then and they're close by then 
they're a rivalry. So, so as long as it makes the game good and the fans enjoy it, then so what? That's that's a good thing about it. Yeah, of course. Um, let's go back to to 2014. Um, you've mentioned Portland; it's a beautiful place. You really wanted to go to MLS. You're really interested in the move. Um, I know, obviously, it was it was on a DP contract as well, which is important in this this particular conversation. But when you want to go to MLS, are you eyeing up potential teams? Have teams spoken to you already? Did, had Portland already made it known they were interested, or do you literally just have to get your agent to speak to, just throw it out there and say, "Look, I got this guy who's in." <laughs> Well, I was, I suppose I was lucky in, obviously it was 2014. It's a bit easier. It was, to me, it was easier to get over here at that time. There wasn't as influx as players and the league wasn't at the standard it is right now. But in 2014, I'd finished my contract at West Brom. I touched down in Las Vegas and my agent rang me, said, oh, Portland uh, Timbers want to sign you. And I'm like, who, where? You know, I knew the MLS, but we, I knew LA Galaxy. I knew yeah, New yeah. Red Bulls. I didn't know the other teams. So he's like, look on the map. It's basically 45 minutes up. They'll fly you up. They'll show you around. And uh, I was like, absolutely. Yeah, why not? I'll, I'll, I'll take in everything and listen to everybody. So flew up here and they showed me around. And I was like, I'm not going to swear, but I was like, oh, you buggers. You've done me. <laughs> I, I, I couldn't turn it down. The place was, the place was beautiful. The fans were incredible. I went to watch Dallas and they were losing 2-0 at half time and they were still singing. They were still going. They actually drew the game. I, and that was all down to the fans. So it was just a beautiful place. The people were great. And I thought, you know what? I need something different. After my West West Brom contract ended, I needed something different. I needed to get away. And what a better place to come to Portland. And they gave me everything that I needed in, in sort of in football and, and to enjoy it again, which was was incredible. I know, um, obviously, you, you came back over to the UK after your time there. We often see players move in a lot more freely in MLS rather than, uh, than how things work over here in, in the UK. Is there, are you one of those players that just couldn't have done that? Could you not have ever played for anybody else in MLS? No, not really. I think, obviously, a lot of players here, um, you don't, some don't get the choice. Some, sometimes you'll come into a change room and your stuff's moved somewhere and you've been traded and you've got no choice in it. I think, obviously, my contract helped in the sense that I, I couldn't have probably been done, that happened to, certainly in the first part of my, my contract. Yeah. I don't think it happened to me. And uh, it's, it's an incredible way to go. I've just been traded and suddenly you come in. I didn't know, see anyone or know anyone that happened to but I think early part of the MLS, you were just suddenly came in and your stuff was somewhere else. And it was like, right, you've got to move teams now and you've got no choice. You've got to up, uproot your family and go somewhere else. So, uh, yeah, I, I don't think that would have happened to me per se. But if I'd have had to do it, if Portland didn't want me, then I'd have had to go somewhere else. So <laughs> they were paying me, paying me my money and Portland didn't want me. I'm just thankful uh, they wanted me up until my, uh, my time had run out there. Let's be honest, there was no way they were trading you away, mate. Absolutely no way. Um, it would have been mad. Um, so you're, you're in MLS around that time, 2014, 2015. Obviously, we know the bigger names. Who did you play against who's maybe not one of those big, you know, big stars in MLS, maybe not on a DP contract that you thought, these are, these are decent? The player, we had him in our team, Duncan Nagby, and I've said it all the way throughout my career. <laughs> I still say it now. He, were, he is phenomenal. And he could have gone and played in the Premier League. He would have easily fit in. Someone that wasn't on a DP contract at that time, I'm not sure if he's now, but certainly wasn't getting paid the wages that he probably should yeah. have got. But Port and Timbers, they looked after him. They made sure his family and he was all well. Uh, and he's some player. He really was. And uh, it was a pleasure to play against him or play with him and, and actually play against him in the Atlanta 18 uh, MS Cup final as well. So uh, he was some player. The other player, probably centre forward wise, it's probably Dom Dwyer. Certainly, early part he was he was a nuisance, and we used to have some right ding dong battles. You know, <laughs> if I, if he kicked me, I'd say, "Well, it's my turn now," and I'd get him, and he'd go right with one all, and then he'd maybe kick me again, and I'd get him, and it was someone that you could enjoy the game against. The referee didn't necessarily have to have to book us until we'd done each other three or four times, but he's <laughs> someone that I always enjoyed playing against, and one that. I don't necessarily got the all the accolades because he didn't score loads of goals, but he was certainly an important part for the teams that he played for. 
Uh, yeah, interesting. I mean, this is a common theme on the show, on the podcast, week in, week out. Dom Dwyer obviously was my hero at Orlando City, uh, and he now plays for Atlanta United. I don't think I need to say any more. Um, but you do not surprise me that he gave you a bit of a kick in. That's not surprising. <laughs> that surprised me at all. Loves a yellow. Um, so <laughs> when you're when you're a designated player, you you, know, you mentioned um, Nagby there. I mean, I'll be amazed if he's not on some. I know it's published. I haven't looked. I'll be amazed if he's not on some serious money. You know the way that Columbus drew him drew him home um but when you're a designated player how much more pressure is there on you in the locker room and in the stadium and and obviously with the with the front office as well yeah I think I think there is is pressure but I think for me it was all I was always under pressure coming in you know you're you're a Premier League player uh coming into Port and Timbers and you're expected Merritt expected, Gavin expected, Caleb expected. They all before expected me to perform well. And I put that pressure on myself. I, I expected myself to try and elevate the team, elevate the organisation uh, and elevate everyone around me. And I think that's, that's probably the hardest part. The DP stuff and the wages and you know what, it, it's always diff, difficult because there's some people not earning that amount of money. I think if you're respectful about it and you know, you take players out and you, you pay for certain stuff and meals and drinks and, and treat people, then if you can get the, the group bonded, uh, then I think it works. If you come in and you don't go out with people and you don't hang around with people and you're this big time Charlie and you're rolling around in your Lamborghini and you're not getting involved with no one, then no one's going to like you. And that, that could be all walks of life. But I think for me, it was something that I put pressure on to make sure that I helped the team get to a point where we either won or I elevated the organisation with the other players to get them to a point that where I think they are right now. You've not surprised me that with what you've said there and, and how you approach that situation. I can imagine there certainly are some big time Charlies in MLS on a big DP counter. <laughs> um, but what, not, not yourself specifically, and I, I don't want to get into numbers, but when you're playing in the UK, is it, is it more shrouded in mystery how much other players around you are, are earning? Because obviously in MLS, it's all published. Everybody knows and everybody knows if you're on a DP contract. In the UK, is it a little bit different in the locker room? It's completely different. You don't know, uh, you don't know what someone else is on. You might get a, like a whiff in a newspaper. Oh, yeah, he's coming on his mm. six grand a week. You don't know. And no one shares it either. Like growing up, it was, an, it was a common, you know, it was an unspoken, it was a written rule that, you don't ask what someone's on. You don't, you don't, it doesn't matter what they're on. My agent always used to say it as we were, I was going up and he had other players. Don't, don't look what they're on. Just look what you're on and try and get better at what you're doing. If you start looking what other people are doing, then it will take your mind off it. You know, you can, you'll, you'll, you won't be concentrating on the real thing is football and you should get your draft rewards after that. So it was certainly something different. It was weird, very strange to see. The money, you know, plasters all over the, I don't know, wherever it, they stick it right now. And uh, and players knowing what you're on. But I think it even makes people more even, I don't know, um, respectful if you do it the right way in mm. what you're earning compared to other people. And it can make or break a change room, that's for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you obviously played basically in every MLS city in your time uh, with Portland outside of Rose City where's where's the best place to play what are the best cities what are the best stadiums uh, one of the cities I loved was Montreal I, only, I th- think I only went there once or twice but it was a beautiful city um, it was it's a, it reminded me of Edinburgh I don't know if you, you've been out there yeah, it's yeah, like yeah. all the cobbled, cobbled streets um, and it, that, it was beautiful it was it was combined with Edinburgh don't have this but it was combined with beautiful weather and it was right, you could see the boats rolling in and these rooftop bars and things like that. Edinburgh's lovely in its own right, and I love Edinburgh, but this was sort of <laughs> elevated even more and it made it even more special. So it was a great place to sort of certainly visit. The fans and, and all that weren't, weren't the best, but I think that was certainly a city I always loved going to. Uh, Sporting Kansas City, I always enjoyed playing away there. Their fans were like the Timbers fans. They, they loved their football um, and they shout and holler at you and try and put you off and I love all that you get a little bit with the crowd and somewhere that I always enjoyed going and certainly winning was always nice when we went there 
Yeah, you strike me as someone who in, enjoys a bit of a hostile atmosphere to get really get you going. <laughs> um, after after your time in MLS, you uh, you obviously played for some championship teams. That's really important, I think, in in this conversation. Maybe not now, but back then, very similar level or not? Is it fair to compare MLS and the championship at that point? Yeah, I think so. I think it's the the bigger games. The bigger games in MLS are you know top end championship. But in Premier League to me, you know, you, one, yeah. one you get all the you get the fans and it's full crowd. The pitch is great, the stadium's great, and they're getting to that level. They just need to more teams to be able to do to get to that level. But I think more or less it's probably like middle end, middle of Championship um, most of the games, and it, it's a lot of the Championship games. I think maybe a little bit more direct with their teams. MLS, everyone's trying to play. Most of the time, Red Bulls know that they'll they'll sort of get the ball forward. Philly will do the same. So yeah. a lot more teams are sort of trying to change the type of style, which I love it in the MLS. I was hating that everybody was playing short from the goal kick and they were trying to pass through it. If you're not good enough to do that, why bother? So I yeah. think the teams are changing a little bit. So I would say it's more middle of the championship, which boded well for me when I was when I obviously finished my time to come home and you know sort of see my career you know, down and out, really. Yeah, I, I think you've hit the nail on the head when you've got uh, uh, only a, a certain number of designated player contracts, only a certain amount of money you can spend. Teams wanted to go out and spend on attackers. And maybe not in Portland, but elsewhere, teams didn't quite spend on the defence, but then wanted to play out of the back. And that, for me, doesn't make any sense. <laughs> make it tough. <laughs> um. Uh, let's talk about uh, Portland this season because um, starting to become a bit of a familiar theme that maybe they don't start off great, but you'd never, ever, ever write this team off from making the playoffs. Same again this year? I- I'm not going to disagree with saying the same again this year, that's for sure. I think Gio would uh, bring me straight up after this and, <laughs> and shout and holler at me. So uh, I think, yeah, I think Gio is still obviously trying to get his team to figure out a few things. Obviously, uh, Seb up, Sebastian Blanco didn't, have a full preseason. He obviously was struggling with injury. More of the same. Two two big players for him. You know, Larice Mabiala and Dero Zubis. They were the same. They were out injured. So this team is sort of working its way back in. Um, and now Gio's sort of trying to find that sort of right combination or right flavour just to get his team going and and trying to get that spark. So it's been a tough couple of weeks. And I know that I obviously speak to Gio. It's been a tough couple of weeks, but. He's someone that is not going to shirk away from a challenge. And certainly all the coaching staff and all the players, and, and in all honesty, all of us, all the organisations are certainly not going to shirk away from it. And we're used to being that team that people don't talk about per se, but they certainly do talk, talk about us come the end of the season. And, and to me, that's, that's what being a Portland Timber is. It's fighting against everybody that writes them off. It fights against every fan that doesn't really fancy Portland and fights against everyone that thinks that Portland isn't a big big organisation, which is which is great. I love that. And I think everyone else involved with Portland teams do. It's certainly not our view. I mean, everybody we speak to tells us how incredible the stadium is, how incredible the fans is. We know that. We can see it even on the TV. Um, but in terms of this team, I mean, you know, since in the time that we've been doing this, this show, five, six years, Portland have always been a force, you know. And, you know, obviously... With with yourself, they got to the to the MLS Cup final. It always been a force, and I think it's mad to write off. Even you know, Seattle have not not started well either. Um, it's mad to write them off. They're going to be there. It's just at the expense of who the, who's already in that you know uh, in that playoff spot that's going to have to drop out. And it's it's a tough one this year. It is a tough one, and and the league every year gets better and better. And I say it because it, it elevates every year. We get better and better, and you don't move with the times and don't move along with it, or your uh, they call them DP players or your big players. If, if you get injuries to them through the preseason, or for, it's like any most teams. We look at it, even the Premier League. If you're one of the teams that are probably outside the top seven, and you're one of your best centre forwards or number tens or defender gets injured, and they're not back till Christmas, then it's likely that you're not going to have a great start. Timbers sort of normally have that in performances, but they've had that with injuries this year, and. Uh, you know, you look at the power rankings and what they bring out, and it's great. But then Portland are never at the top. They're never expected to do well. But Gio obviously gets the team, and the coach staff always get the team to the, the place that really, at the end of the season, where you really need to hit a run. And after this break that we're having right now, we're going to 
we're going to see where the team's at and where it's heading because it's a big, like the summer months are, are huge, certainly coming before the end of the season. You mentioned the power rankings. No one's looking at those. No one, no one in their right mind is looking at those. Do you, do you remember when you're at school and you have to pick, like if you're a captain, you pick who's going to be on your team, right? If, I'm, if I've got all of the MLS teams in front of me, right, and I, I'm, I need to win a football match, I'm not picking who's top of the MLS power rankings and I'm not looking at Port. I'm thinking, oh, I'm not going to pick Portland. They're one of the best teams in MLS. Yeah, they're, they're the grittiest and, and the grindiest and, and they've, got, they've, they've always had top quality players. It's just... I know it is strange. Obviously, the the league wants to make sure that certain teams are put at the top because then people will notice them and and they talk about them. But it's good. The Portland Timbers like it that way. The organisation is built like that way, and uh, I don't think it'll ever change, which would be nice. <laughs> um, before I let you go, I've got to ask you about that MLS Cup final. Obviously, it was your last game in MLS. I'm sure you wanted it to finish a little bit differently, but. That experience of that that game that day talk me through it. I remember it so clearly because Henry's an Atlanta fan, so I was rooting for you just as much as everybody else. Uh, <laughs> but uh, talk me through that experience and you know the curtain uh, falling on your on your MLS career like that. Yeah, Joe, you know it was amazing. I think the start of the season didn't pan out. Obviously, I didn't I didn't play quite a lot at the start of the season. So to finish off in an MLS Cup final and trying to win it twice. Um, was incredible and, and getting there was a was a feat. I think the run that we took and then going to Atlanta, obviously I'd love to have had it in Portland, um, but going to Atlanta, that stadium and them fans was one of the wildest experiences I've ever had. Playing at Wembley against Arsenal was was obviously the biggest, but yeah. Atlanta with in the dome and their fans was it was it was it was crazy. I couldn't even speak to Larice, and he was ten feet away. I couldn't tell him <laughs> left shoulder, right shoulder, because you, the fans were so loud. It was amazing. So to finish off that way, to finish off of getting to an, another MLS Cup final with Portland, it was something that I started off wanting to do. You know, Merritt and Gavin and Caleb asked me the question about my ambition, and sort of that that typified it: two MLS Cup finals, winning one and losing one. Uh, sort of showed my ambition of where I wanted to play at this club and this club to play at. So it's an incredible experience. The whole build up, you know, the media, suddenly you get a load of media, you get family flying in and you're flying in on a charter plane and all this v- VIP experience. It was a great way to sort of end my time with Portland, certainly my playing career, um, certainly at Atlanta, given we didn't win it, which was always disappointing. A shame that you have to sort of walk off the pitch watching down to Nagby, pick up another trophy, which is always annoying, and Atlanta. <laughs> but do you know what? They were a great team, and uh, we just couldn't get it done on the day. And uh, it was just a good way to go out, really. It was, was exceptional. That Atlanta team, when you've got that atmosphere and you can't even hear what's going on, and then you've got to deal with Miggy and you've got to deal with Joseph Martinez, that's your worst nightmare, right? It was some team. I mean, Almiron just didn't stop running. He still does it now, but it was, you know didn't stop running the ball don't come off his foot and you just either got to kick him or try and get get around him and Martinez was on fire I mean everything touched went to gold so they had they had something it was all it was always going to be difficult we knew that you know going there J-Bo obviously obviously it was his sort of his start off year or you know just getting into it so it was always going to be tough but we fancied ourselves we had chances I still look back at the game now we had chances we had Certainly had chances to try and keep it a little bit more close, but in the end, their quality came through and, uh, you know, it was just uh, tough to stop in the end. And I think the the league was willing on Atlanta to finally, you know, win, start off winning one with this big team. So it was uh, us against normally like everybody else. Yeah, MLS don't half love Atlanta. Uh, anyway... Liam, uh, honestly, uh, as a as a player who's been over here and, and done it and, and now doing it over in the States as well, a pleasure to speak to you. Thank you so much for joining us and for, for talking so openly and for kicking Dom Dwyer. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> it was all my pleasure, that's for sure. So no, thank you for having me on. It's great. <laughs> The MLS UK Show. So there we have it. Really enjoyed that chat with Liam Ridgewell, somebody who, of course, has played over here in the UK, has played in MLS and has made themselves a home over in the States, over in the West now, which is excellent. And as you heard, it's um, a dream of mine to go and visit. So uh, hopefully he'll allow me to go and stay with him. 
be a bit cheap, wouldn't it? Um, but we'll be back very, very soon. Once Henry's back from his honeymoon, we'll be doing another stoppage time next week. So we'll be catching up on everything he's missed while he's been away in MLS. Of course, there's some uh, there's some fixtures finally this weekend as well, which we'll be able to get our teeth into and lots of news as well. So uh, stay tuned to the MLS UK show. Make sure you're following us at MLS UK show on Twitter and Instagram and Make sure you're subscribed and you'll be first to see videos like this.